Earlier this year, I was driving through the countryside with a little girl of six, and she pointed out some flowers by the wayside. I asked her what she thought flowers were for. She gave a very thoughtful answer. Two things, she said, to make the world pretty and to help the bees make honey for us. Well, I thought that was a very nice answer, and I was very sorry I had to tell her that it wasn't true. Her answer is not too different from the answer that most people throughout history would have given. The very first chapter of the Bible sets it out. Man has dominion over all living things. The animals and plants are there for our benefit. This attitude was unquestioned throughout the Middle Ages, and it really persists to this day. One pious man in the Middle Ages thought that weeds were there to benefit us because it's so good for our spirit to have to go and pull them up. And another reverend gentleman thought that the louse was indispensable because it provided a powerful incentive to cleanliness. There's also been the suggestion that animals positively want to do their bit for the good of mankind and even want to be eaten by us. Well, this idea reminds me of a brilliant passage from one of my favorite works of fiction, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. In fact, I'm so fond of this passage that I was wanting somebody to read it out. Would anybody like to volunteer to, to you see, right, you, you please. Your name is? Uh, Douglas. Douglas what? Uh, Adams. Douglas Adams, what an amazing coincidence. <laughs> A large dairy animal approached Zaphod Beeblebrox's table. A meaty bovine quadruped with watery eyes, small horns, and an ingratiating smile on its lips. Good evening. It lowed and sat back heavily on its haunches. I am the main dish of the day. May I interest you in parts of my body? Its gaze was met by looks of startled bewilderment by Arthur and naked hunger from Zaphod Beeblebrox. Something off the shoulder, perhaps, suggested the animal, braised in a white wine sauce. Uh, your shoulder, said Arthur in a horrified whisper. But naturally my shoulder, sir, mooed the animal contentedly. Nobody else's is mine to offer. Zaphod leapt to his feet and started prodding and feeling the animal's shoulder appreciatively. Oh, the rump is very good, murmured the animal. I've been exercising it and eating plenty of grain, so there's a lot of good meat there. You mean this animal actually wants us to eat it, exclaimed Arthur. That's absolutely horrible. It's the most revolting thing I've ever heard. What's the problem, Earthman, said Zaphod. I, I just don't want to eat an animal that's standing there inviting me to, said Arthur. It's heartless. Better than eating an animal that doesn't want to be eaten, said Zaphod. But that's not the point, protested Arthur. Then he thought about it for a moment. All right, he said, maybe it is the point. I don't care. I don't want to think about it now. I'll just, uh, I'll just, I'll just have a green salad. <laughs> May I urge you to consider my liver, asked the animal. It must be very rich and tender by now. I've been force-feeding myself for months. <laughs> a green salad, said Arthur firmly. The animal looked at him disapprovingly. Are you going to tell me, snapped Arthur, that I shouldn't have a green salad? Well, said the animal, I know many vegetables that are very clear on that point, which is why it was eventually decided to cut through the whole tangled problem and breed an animal that actually wanted to be eaten and was capable of saying so clearly and unambiguously. And here I am. Glass of water, please, said Arthur. <laughs> Look, are we hungry or not, snapped Zaphod. We'll just have four steaks, please, very, very rare and quickly. The animal staggered to its feet. A very wise choice, sir, if I may say so. Very good, it said with a mellow gurgle. I'll just nip off and shoot myself. <laughs> he turned and gave a friendly wink to Arthur. Don't worry, sir, he said. I'll be very humane. <laughs> Thank you very much.